Hello, everyone. Um, we believe it is very important to put type design in perspective, and that type is there to interact with the world and open new doors. It is not a remote island. It's part of the whole design ecosystem. So that's why, since the beginning of the Type Paris program, the TP talks have always been uh, constructed with the same model. Uh, we always have two different presentations, one from a graphic designer and one from a type designer, one from someone who makes great type and one from someone who makes great things with type. Uh, tonight we're shaking things up a little bit. Uh, life is a little bit more complex than, than that. Um, so our two guests are both very much involved with the making of letter form and the making of type uh, today. But what's great is they both have their own way of putting letter shape in perspective. And they both have a very personal take on uh, the history of letter forms. Um, and personally, I think their, their work both have a very special place within the design ecosystem. They also both uh, have very lovely dogs for <laughs> some reason. Um, so the first speaker tonight is uh, Dan. Uh, Dan is probably the most German of all Americans. Uh, he's also the most uh, American of all Germans. Um, Dan, you studied uh, graphic design at the Rhode Island School of uh, Design in the US and type design at the University of Reading in England. Uh, you are now based in, uh, I know, <laughs> you are now based in, in, in Germany, in Berlin. Uh, you've had many lives, like a cat kind of, even though you're a dog person, but um, <laughs> you've worked for Linotype for several years. You've taught typography and type design in many courses over Germany and China. You've been an independent designer for several years as well, and you're now, uh, you are, you just, like, uh, in last January, completed your PhD at the Braunschweig University of Art in Germany, and you're, you're now back uh, to type design at uh, Lucas Font, which makes it a tradition, too, because Lucas was a speaker for the first year, so you're the first returning, returning type foundries to, to type Paris. Thank you. Um, you have always been very involved with the community. Uh, you've made lectures at uh, too many lectures that, I, that I, I can't count them, but you've, you've been at many conferences. Uh, you also co-founded the famous uh, Tipo Stamtisch in Offenbach, which is a free, independent uh, event that is open to anyone uh, who wants to talk letters, uh, which is kind of what we're trying to do here with the TP Talks in Paris. So I'm, I'm very happy that you're now part of the Thai Paris family. Uh, so type designer, writer, teacher, researcher, lecturer, historian, and above all, above all fantastic classmates. Uh, I would not be who I am without him. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dan Reynolds. Uh, right, I'm going to. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Sorry, this is the first night we're rehearsing this whole thing. There is, well, you've, most of you have been here before, so this is usually Jean-Francois's job, but it's the first time I'm announcing it. There is this, the, the infamous uh, tweet and Instagram uh, competition. So if you please tweet and post uh, with the hashtag TP Talks, nine, TP Talks or just TP Talks 19? Okay, oh, TP Talks 19. And uh, I believe uh, the best tweet or Instagram post will be selected by a very confidential jury during the nights and uh, <laughs> there might be a few free goodies to grab. So the stage is all yours now. Dan. All right, well, I uh, can confirm that Mathieu is the best, but I suspect that most of you already know that. In Germany this year, we're locked in a nonstop celebration of the Bauhaus's centenary. 
Uh, as many of you may know, the distinctive style graphic designers are familiar with today is something that the school developed a little bit later, in the mid-1920s, after they moved from Weimar to Dessau. When designers worked on magazines in 1926, they could only specify fonts of type available in print shops, uh, that the, pr the, the print shops had available. Uh, and it was only those types in that print shop that could be used to typeset and print the pages. Most print shops were very small and uh, would not have had very many typefaces available, at least in a wide range of sizes. The sans serif typefaces that you can see uh, here on these two pages, especially up at the top, uh, were made at a Leipzig type foundry named Shelter and Giesecke around the year 1890. Uh, Shelter and Giesecke at that time was probably the largest foundry in Germany. Despite the radical nature of many Bauhaus reforms in education, design, ar or architecture, its typography did not always use new typefaces. Now, there's some disagreement today as to whether the printers hired by the new typographers could have logistically even had access to the newest typefaces, but it's possible that they intentionally avoided using new fonts. Uh, Jan Schickold was never part of the Bauhaus himself. In his famous book on the new typography, he described the type from the 1920s as being less good than the old sans faces. While Chicol didn't single out Shelter and Giesecke's sans serifs as positive examples, I think that they were representative of the good kind of old type that he preferred. Um, please allow me to introduce myself a bit further. Uh, for the last decade, I've been working on a doctorate in which I looked at the relationships between German type foundries and freelance German type designers between 1871 and 1914. I feel a bit sheepish mentioning this here because that 43-year historical period was one in which Germany never won France's coveted favorite neighboring country award. Not even once. After finishing my research in March uh, uh, 2018, I found myself suddenly without an ongoing research project. And this was kind of a shock. I felt a bit naked without the project that had accompanied me for so long. So I quickly wrote up a new research idea, uh, pulled together a little bit of funding, and got myself what has basically become a new hobby. For the last year, I've been tracking the spread of all the sans serif typefaces sold in Germany during the 19th century. You could view this as something like a tangent from my previous research. I've published some small bits already about my sans serif work, so I was really excited to be invited here tonight. But when I got this email a few weeks ago, truth be told, I could not think of any ways in which my research had influenced my work as a type designer or how being a designer influenced my research. But the next half hour is uh, what I've come up with to try to answer this briefing. Just to make sure that we're all on the same page, when I say sans serif, I mean the kind of typefaces that, at least historically, have been described as anti here in French. Um, many of the type that I'll address tonight had uh, the word grotesque as part of their names, uh, like this one, uh, the heaviest uh, uh, type that you see on these pages, like in the word Bauhaus, um, is uh, in Shelter and Giesecke's Breite Fette Grotesque, which is not really a proper name, like Times New Roman. Uh, instead, it's a descriptive term made up of three German words that just mean extended, heavy sans serif. Breite Fette Grotesque was part of a family of extended sans serifs that Shelter and Giesecke made around 1890. Unlike the earlier sans serif designs that I will show tonight, Shelter and Giesecke did not share this design with other foundries in Germany. There were about 70 foundries in Germany at this time. When 
Shelter Nizica did sell fonts of this family to other type foundries. It would only be to type foundries outside of Germany, for instance, to Haas in Basel or Teterode in Amsterdam. Uh, I'm going to refer to this timeline a few times tonight. Uh, you can see uh, over there toward the end where Breite Feta Grotesque uh, falls in relation to the other things that I'm going to talk about. It's always good to begin uh, at the beginning. This is the first sans serif typeface that was sold in Germany. It was a single size, all caps design, which was imported by a printer slash type founder in Magdeburg uh, from Caslon in London. Uh, here it is in Caslon's uh, own specimen catalog. Uh, the design is, uh, is from England, and the Caslon foundry sold it in multiple sizes. Uh, Edward Hainel imported one size into Germany, uh, but he was not the only German to sell some sizes of this typeface. I've also seen it so far in two other companies' specimens. Uh, but since most of Caslon's related type sizes were not imported into Germany, the German foundries who did sell what you could call typeface zero eventually married that design into ad hoc families. Here's just uh, four uh, uh, styles of about 12 uh, fonts. Uh, so other fonts that they could also generically call all caps, bold, condensed, sans serifs in different sizes, uh, e even though the letters didn't exactly match. So if you have a look at the letter M in each line of uh, this image, there, there is an M in each of the four lines. Uh, the M's are all very different. The third line, the, uh, uh, the typeface that was imported in 1833, uh, it's kind of wide, and the counterforms are nicely balanced, uh, the three of them. Uh, the top two lines have uh, uh, another kind of M with a very pinched top counterform, uh, and then there's a, a, a condensed M uh, at the bottom, uh, and the R's are also uh, very different. There's three different R's here. Uh, most of the R's, or at least these other two, have straight legs, but this has a nice little curve here at the bottom. It's a very, this is actually a very un-German kind of curve for the R in the 19th century. Since I'm already mentioning designs being imported and then sold by multiple companies, I should explain what I mean exactly. Uh, when I say that Hainel in Magdeburg sold Caslon's design from London, I do not mean that Hainel's punch cutters looked very closely at specimens of Caslon's types and then drew new punches matching the original design as closely as possible. Instead, what I mean is the Caslon Candry cut one set of punches for their design and then they used those punches to make at least two identical strikes. Uh, one of those sets of strikes was sold to Hainel. Uh, Caslon's staff would have cleaned up their own strikes uh, from which they would have made the matrices from which they could cast a near infinite number of letters for printers. Uh, and then Hainel's staff uh, did the same thing with the strikes that they had gotten. So from about the 16th century through the 19th century, a type foundry didn't just have one kind of product. Uh, they sold more than just cast fonts of type. Uh, another possible thing that they could engage in was to sell duplicate strikes, as I just mentioned, uh, as Caslon did, and indeed as Hainel would do with its own new designs. Since I'm now uh, pretty deep in one of the biggest features of 19th century type, here's a quick overview of how foundries behaved before they stopped sharing uh, their new fonts with other foundries. So, uh, many printers bought all of their type from the same foundry, uh, which meant that each foundry had to make every kind of font that a printer might want. A type foundry needed to get its hands then on every conceivable style, but it didn't have to make all of those styles in-house. Uh, indeed, in-house type making capabilities weren't something that every type uh, foundry even had. So imagine that, a type foundry that has basically no type designers. Um, maybe even half of them uh, at the time uh, had no uh, new type making capabilities. 
transporting fonts of metal type is probably still expensive today. Uh, uh, type could be sent back then uh, over long distances by river or sea, uh, and eventually across land by train, but otherwise they just had horse-drawn carriages. Now, not only did printers get all of their type from one foundry, usually, they probably picked the closest possible foundry. Uh, it took a while before typefaces got descriptive names. One of the very first typefaces named after its designer was published uh, here in Paris, uh, the Peignot Foundry's Grasset types, which were designed by Eugène Grasset in the late 1890s. So as I uh, see it, type founding as an industry really did change at the beginning of the 20th century, and most of these changes are probably applicable to French firms too. Uh, so type made after 1900 was increasingly exclusive to the foundry that made it. Um, you, you wouldn't want your customers to have a reason to jump ship to one of your competitors, now would you? After 1900, foundries sold their types to much wider customer bases. Some of this had to do with improved transportation networks. Um, but it became increasingly common for German foundries to ship orders all over the, the country, so not just to a geographic region within Germany, uh, but also to printers working abroad, uh, especially to printers in Austria, Scandinavia, and Russia. Um, also, uh, South America. Uh, uh, sales to France and Britain were very low. I'm sure that uh, Jean-Francois uh, would agree with this, uh, finding a good name for a new typeface is one of the most difficult steps in bringing a new font to market. A family in today's sense would have rarely been released all at once a century ago. It would have been more common for a foundry to keep adding styles to a design that was already selling well. I showed you the first sans serif uh, sold in Germany from uh, 1833, and over the next several decades, many more designs came onto the market. Some were Im imported from abroad, uh, and others originated within German-speaking foundries. With time, uh, designs were made that weren't all heavy or only had capital letters. Uh, these were shared across a national and an international network of type foundries, too. Uh, in addition to importing typefaces from Great Britain, German foundries also got new type from foundries here in France uh, and from the United States. And indeed, German designs were sold abroad. Um, nevertheless, most of the sans serif typefaces that were sold in Germany in the 19th century were not imported. Uh, they were actually made within the country. Dozens of new sans serif designs were created uh, in Germany from at least the 1850s onward. Uh, and even though um, these designs typically only had one weight or style, uh, they were almost always available in a whole range of sizes. So from six or eight point up to maybe 72 or 84 point. Uh, I can't show all of these typefaces tonight, but I do want to highlight a few of the original 19th century German sans serifs. So this is the Benjamin um, Krebs uh, Type Foundry's Moderne Steinschriften typeface. Uh, and that name implies that the letters were like those that were then being used in lithography. Uh, the foundry that made it uh, was based in Frankfurt, and they first showed uh, the typeface in an 1865 full-page ad, uh, which you can see here. These types made their way into almost half of all of the foundries operating from within Germany, Austria, and German-speaking Switzerland. Uh, so what you're looking at here is one of the most widely distributed sans serifs from German-speaking Europe in the 19th century. At the bottom of the specimen is a line of text uh, uh, in, in small type that reads in German uh, that the punches for most or probably all, of these sizes were the property of the Krebs foundry and that matrices of them were available for sale. So this is marketed at other type foundries. Krebs published their Moderne Zeitschriften design in 1865. 
uh, in the same year, another punch cutter and tie founder in Frankfurt named Johann Christian Bauer. He's the Bauer who set up the Bauer type foundry that later made Futura. Published a design that was very similar to Krebs's face. Uh, if you look at the A in Schlacht in the middle of this image and compare it with the A in Naturhistorische, the very first word in the image, you can see that Bauer's letters have less contrast. Uh, Bauer's R, the capital R, for instance, that comes up twice in Brandenburg, is very distinctive. Um, it has an outstroke at its bottom right. Uh, a third design in this general vein was published in 1866 by Flinch, which was like uh, Krebs and Bauer, also based in Frankfurt, so there must have been something in the water uh, that made uh, uh, tie foundries want to publish designs that look uh, just like this. Bauer and Flinch's designs were also picked up by other German foundries, but not nearly by as many foundries as sold uh, the Krebs design that you can see at the very top. Uh, so this uh, middle catalog uh, was printed in 1914 or 1915 after the outbreak of the First World War, and this is blatant uh, anti-French propaganda. I'm sorry. Here's a fuller look at uh, Johann Christian Bauer's design, uh, since I'm going to show uh, it again at the conclusion of my talk tonight. Uh, you can see uh, here all but one or two of the sizes that he cut himself. Another design that was picked up by about half of the German-speaking foundries of the 19th century was this heavy sans serif from Danzig uh, called Zeitungsgrotesk. Uh, that name just means newspaper sans, and it was intended for headlines and advertisements within newspapers. Uh, Petit is a, also in France was an eight-point size, so it's very small. So this was for use in newspapers, but very small type at the head of a column announcing a sale of ten cows or two houses or whatever. Zeitung's Grotesque was also initially advertised with single-page type specimens that were mailed out to subscribers of printing journals. Uh, you can see the second of the Käfermann Foundry's two specimen sheets announcing this typeface's release, uh, printed in 1875, uh, right here. Like the Moderna Steintriften specimen sheet I showed a few minutes ago, this sheet includes a notice uh, for other type founders, stating that Zeitung's grotesques punches belonged to the Kaferman foundry and that copper matrices were available for sale. Uh, so about a year after this was printed, Germany passed a, a design patent registration law uh, which uh, allowed designers to protect their intellectual property. That law is actually still in effect in Germany for typefaces. Um, and the system Dido that uh, you see at the end of that little line uh, means that the bodies of Zeitung's grotesque type were delineated in uh, Didot points. And indeed, after the Franco-Prussian War, German foundries agreed to use French measurements for point sizes and height to paper as a new national standard. I don't think it helped sales of type to France, though. Uh, Schelter and Giesecke at Leipzig, who I keep mentioning, also carried Kefemann's Zeitung's grotesque design. However, they added several sizes of the design to their own library, uh, which means that they expanded another foundry's design in-house. Uh, on this specimen, if you look closely, you can see that there are exclamation points, which I've highlighted here, after the 24 and 36 point sizes. So those are small indications that these two type sizes um, uh, uh, were produced by Shelter and Giesecke and could theoretically be acquired by other uh, type foundries. All right, so now I'm coming to another design, and this one might be familiar to some of you. Uh, indeed, if you use any 19th century German sans serifs in your work, it's probably this one. This is Accidents Grotesque, as it was originally published. Uh, so despite the lowercase t having an angle flag, uh, that eventually got edited out of the design. Uh, but this was the initial regular weight, uh, which was the first weight of the family published. Uh, it was published by Berthold, a large type foundry from Berlin in 1898, so just at the end of the 19th century. And like Shelter and Giesecke's Breite Fetter Grotesque, 
This was a design, at least in Germany itself, that could only be, be bought from the company who made it. So if you were a German printer, you could only buy this typeface from Berthold. Uh, if you are a printer somewhere else, like Latvia or Russia or, uh, uh, or Holland, you might be in luck because Berthold licensed this design to some foreign foundries. Uh, that way you could also get the type cheaper because you wouldn't have had to have the, the type shipped to you from Germany. Other German foundries uh, do include accidents grotesque in their pre-First World War specimens, but those were foundries that had already been bought by Berthold. Uh, a lot of type foundries got gobbled up by Berthold over time. One of those foundries was a Stuttgart firm called Bauer & Co., which was founded by the son of Johann Christian Bauer, uh, a man I named, dropped earlier, and we'll come back to. In 1895, Bauer & Co. published a single-weight, multi-sized display face called Chatierte Grotesque, which means shaded sands, uh, which you can see here. It's hard to look at the origins of Accidents Grotesque today uh, from our own vantage point. We all know, at least in this room, I think, uh, that Accidents Grotesque was one of the most successful typefaces of the 20th century. Uh, but in 1898, sans-air typefaces weren't even used for setting book text yet. Um, Accidents Grotesque's name just means something like jobbing sans-serif, uh, and it was a typeface that you would use for your business card or an event invitation. Today, as designers, we would design accidents grotesque first, and then we would add the drop shadows as a special sort of add-on display version of the font. But that's not what happened in the 1890s. Uh, Bauer & Co's Chatierte Grotesque, or Shaded Sands, uh, was made first. About a year after Bauer & Co. became part of Berthold, Accidents Grotesque was released as a Berthold product. It's possible that Bauer & Co. in Stuttgart was already working toward Accidents Grotesque's release internally, but it is also conceivable that Berthold saw this shaded typeface in Bauer & Co.'s portfolio and decided to make a new product just by clipping off those drop shadows, which was probably the most important decision ever made at the company. You may have read another origin story for Accidents Grotesque, that it was originally published as a typeface called Royal Grotesque, which a Berlin punch cutter named Ferdinand Teinhardt is reported to have made for the Royal Prussian Academy of Sciences in 1880. Teinhardt did indeed do a great deal of work for the Royal Academy, but he did not create a face for them called Royal Grotesque. He may have only ever cut one single sans serif typeface in his long career, which was published in 1886, and which looks nothing like Accidents Grotesque. And this is all completely normal. In the 1870s and the 1880s, sans-serif typefaces just weren't prestigious products to be working on. But here is Royal Grotesque. Berthold made a typeface itself as a lighter weight companion to Accidents Grotesque. The idea that you have overarching families with multiple styles was only starting to establish itself. Royal Grotesque was published after Accidents Grotesque had already been released, not beforehand. Uh, Berthold also kept this design uh, to itself, at least within Germany. Uh, it must have known what it had, and it wasn't sharing, uh, except on the international market. So I want to switch gears here for a moment, because I'm supposed to try and explain how looking at all of these old sans serifs can influence type designers today. Here are three instances of the 1865 Moderna Steintriften design that I showed you before, uh, each from a different foundry. Uh, about 20 other uh, uh, German-speaking foundries carried this design in addition uh, to these three. And uh, here you see uh, 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 each design is the same size. It's 20 point. Comparing typefaces from this time period is tricky because specimen catalogs only show a few words in each size, and the specimen texts themselves are always different from catalog to catalog, so it's really hard to find multiple instances of the same word 
except for the Battle of Minden, which is in every type space specimen book ever printed in Germany in the 19th century because it was the only battle the Prussians ever won that they were happy about, I guess. Um, but I didn't find it in, uh, in this typeface. Uh, so even finding the same letter combinations of the same typeface in different catalogs is difficult. So take my word for it a little bit for tonight. Uh, the amount of white space between the letters uh, in these three versions of the same font is different. These three foundries did not space the design exactly the same way. The reason for that is going to sound a bit heretical uh, because it's not how type design is done today. Uh, but at this time, spacing was not part of what you might call the type design process. So this is difficult for me to say because when it comes to the 21st century, spacing and also kerning are 100% definitely part of type design. Spacing is just as much a part of type design as drawing the letter shapes. But if we go back uh, to this copper matrix, which was used to cast pieces of type, you won't see any markings for that end's width. Now, this is an illustration, but if you look at a real copper matrix, uh, you won't see any marks either. The finished piece of metal type uh, uh, to the right has a fixed width. The width of the character is the width of this piece of uh, uh, lead alloy. And uh, a digital letter N um, also has a defined width in the font. Uh, this is the lowercase uh, N from Work Sans in its heaviest master. Uh, and there's 39 M units of space on the letter's left-hand side and 38 units of space on its right-hand side. In the history of type design, predefined side bearings as part of a letter's design don't really come about until the invention of mechanical typesetting machines like the linotype and especially the monotype, whose letter forms had to fit on a grid that only had a certain number of possible widths available, including width units for the spacing. There are some exceptions that I'm not going to go into, like Benton's self-spacing type, but in general, the widths of letters in foundry type were not defined by the punch cutter or the matrix maker, and definitely not by the type designer, but instead by the typecaster. The person casting the type put the matrix into a casing mold, which for centuries was uh, uh, something you held in your hand uh, until casting machines like this were invented in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and by its position in the casting mold, the letter's side bearings were defined. You had to do this on the fly. A type foundry would usually keep a master font around for comparison to allow for product consistency uh, over time. Otherwise, Johann would space his typeface completely different from uh, uh, Jacob, or Johann might space uh, a typeface one way on Tuesday and another way on Thursday. That would probably be annoying for the customers. Uh, but those master fonts were in-house records. So if you were a type founder and you got duplicate matrices of someone else's typeface, you had to respace it yourself. That um, means that if you're making a digital revival of a foundry typeface from the industrial era today, I think it's okay to take the spacing that you see in the specimens with a little grain of salt. If you see some letter spacing that seems inconsistent, and you don't think it's right for your design, then go ahead and ignore it. Uh, what you see might actually not be right. Uh, indeed, it's hard to define what right uh, would be in this context. I'm um, not suggesting that there's no such thing as bad spacing. Uh, you can really mess up a font if you space it badly. But just don't rely too much on what you see in the old books when working in today's media. Uh, another thing that's vaguely related to this to consider when you look at uh, metal type specimens is that kerning was much more difficult to manufacture in foundry type. Every good digital font has significantly more kerning than most fonts of metal type used to have. 
In fact, there are quite a lot of metal typefaces that had no kerning in them at all. Although, in those situations, the lowercase f would have been designed totally different uh, to this current f that you can see here, which is a serif typeface anyway. So I just mentioned that the definition of a letter's side bearings was not part of the design process for most of the industrial era. And this is true even for well-known typefaces in use today, like Futura. So, okay, Futura is not a 19th century face. Uh, but I have a point that I want to drive home. Uh, what you can see here is a reproduction of a print made from a pattern that was used at Bauer to engrave the matrices for several letters of Futura's original 20-point size. Uh, that is when uh, uh, Futura still had abnormal designs for the letters like the M that you can see here, or the, or the N. Right? Here's the R. Uh, this is an upside down E, that's an upside down lowercase a. Those all got edited out uh, uh, relatively quickly. Um, these outlines were engraved uh, onto the plate from paper drawings that were made by drafts persons in the Bauer uh, type foundry, and they wouldn't be drawings that would have been made by Paul Renner himself. Uh, and you can't see any side bearings to the left or to the right of these letter outlines because there aren't any on the matrix. All typefaces of the industrial era made by big foundries like Bauer, uh, who employed several hundred people at uh, the time of Futura's uh, release, were collaborative efforts. Renner provided the initial design, but his former student, Heinrich Joost, uh, the drawing uh, dude with the glasses, um, and his staff would have made the actual drawings showing the letters working together typographically in each size. And then uh, Louis Hole and his staff would have turned those drawings into the matrices necessary for typecasting. And my uh, image here of these four men doesn't picture all of their assistants or the other people uh, who, for instance, surely would have been responsible for the spacing. Hartman, over here, as the business owner, was responsible for assembling this team, believing in Paul Renner's design, uh, and ensuring that there was money uh, to allow for all of this to happen. In the Bauer Foundry's earlier days, all of those roles would have been the responsibility uh, of one person. Of course, Johann Christian Bauer had help as well. He had, presumably, apprentices, probably some other employees, and he had many sons. He had six sons. Uh, uh, at least three or four of them became punch cutters. Uh, he was responsible for all elements of his uh, typefaces production in a way that neither Hartmann nor Renner, Joost, or Hull would have been for, for, for Tura. Bauer presumably designed this 1860s sans serif himself. He certainly cut, or at least directed the cutting, of all of its punches. He probably oversaw its casting, too, and may have been the person to determine its letter spacing. Digital type designers in the 20th century, in the, let me start that again. Digital type designers in the 21st century, I guess there were digital typeface designers in the 20th century too. Digital type designers in the 21st century have much more in common with Johann Christian Bauer than they do with Paul Renner or Heinrich Joost even though most of us cannot cut punches in steel at actual size the way that Bauer could. No professional group is more interested in the history of commercial type foundries and their typefaces than type designers working today are. Uh, the only reason that I even came to my research topic is because I'm a type designer. During the 1970s, 1980s and 1990s, there were a number of movements uh, within historical research that grouped together are all called history from below, 
It's actually a, a French historiographic concept. In the 1970s, a Swedish journalist named Sven Lundqvist wrote a book called Dig Where You Stand, encouraging everyday people to research the history of their professions. In the book, Lindqvist used cement makers as hypothetical examples. Oh, what is the history of cement making in your country? And how are working conditions for cement makers different in other countries than from your own? Where can you find these things out? I don't make cement, but I sometimes make fonts. So I dug where I stood and began researching the history of type design in Germany, which is basically my adopted country. I don't know who is going to look into our past thoroughly if we don't do it ourselves. And our past needs examining. When you read about the development of Futura, one of the most used typefaces in the history of the planet, you'll find out a lot about its designer, but much less about the people from the company behind the typeface who turned it into a working product. Louis Hull, in this slide now, who must have overseen the engraving of Futura's matrices, is basically in darkness, uh, just as his potential contributions to Futura's final forms are for us today. It gets worse for the Bauer foundry if you travel backwards another 60 or 70 years. We know that Johann Christian Bauer's typefaces uh, uh, existed and we know what they looked like because of the abundance of printed specimens showing them that have survived. Uh, but we know much less about how Bauer ran his company while he was alive uh, or why he developed the products that he, that he did. Uh, in large part because the Bauer Foundry's factory building was destroyed in 1944, along with all the records inside of it. Uh, to date, I've mostly based my research on written sources, uh, type specimens, and reports in printing journals. Even though many foundry's physical artifacts were destroyed, along with business records uh, during the Second World War, I don't mean to imply that no 19th century German foundries, punches, and matrices uh, are still around. In fact, what I'd most like to do next in my research is find some way to integrate an investigation of those surviving artifacts uh, uh, into my work, and that's uh, what I've just started to do. So I'm terrible at endings with these things, so I'll just say that's it. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Dan. This is a very uh, hardcore way to start the season of Thai Paris. That's exactly what we needed. Thank you. Um, I don't know, the students are, or the attendees are, are uh, currently working on their brief at the moment, uh, uh, writing a small paragraph about the project they want to do for the next four weeks. And uh, we'll see, we might have like uh, 14 typefaces inspired by 19th century German uh, sans serif. <laughs> I've also been told during your talk that uh, Jean-Francois needs about five minutes to decide on a name for a typeface, so <laughs> I'm gonna let you decide if that's a good or a bad thing. Um, <laughs> it's so hard. You find the perfect name and then someone else already has it. It is hard. It's getting harder every day. Um, uh, you had a great interview with uh, Gina on uh, on the, it's on Type uh, Paris website. I will encourage you to, to have a look at it. It's very interesting, where you talk about how your research uh, make you or don't, doesn't make you a better designer and the other way around. So I, I'm not going to ask you about that because you answered brilliantly uh, 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 to Gina. But uh, you, you, you've been involving with uh, historical research for a long time now. And, but now you're back on a more like a practical side of the, the job where you work as a type designer. You've worked in different type foundries. You are now working at Lucas Font. Do your experience and as, an, and as a historian 
change the way, not the way you design, but the way you archive or, or, or preserve artifacts of your own work or, or of your own company works? Do you think of the researcher like 100 years from now who will? Yeah, I think about the research, I, I think about future generations of researchers a lot, and I don't have a coherent solution for what to do with, um, with digital files, because um, printouts are, are, are difficult to archive because it requires thinking about how to save the printouts while you're printing them out and marking them up. Uh, and in a studio environment where lots of people are making printouts every day, you don't have standardized templates necessarily. Some people might be printing A4, some people are printing A3. Um, uh, I, I worry about this. Um, in my own work, and I think I probably even started doing this in Reading, I may have stolen the idea from you. Um, when I make a PDF, or other, the other way around, I just gave it away. When I make a <laughs> printout of, I save a PDF, because you know I save old versions of my fonts as I'm updating. Uh, and uh, back when I worked in Font Lab all the time, Font Lab used to crash five million times a day. And so like, if I would have three rounds of corrections, I would have three different font files. And I like time stamped them and everything. But still, activating an old font in your test sheet is a pain. You have to make sure, is it really the file that I was using? And there are ways that you can version track that. But what I do is, or what I think you did, <laughs> was you would, as you print, you would also save a PDF. So you can just open the old PDF if you want to print out the way the typeface looked um, six weeks ago or six months ago and compare it with later versions. Um, and uh, PDFs are probably a good uh, uh, archival format. Uh, I, it's probably a much better archival format than you know, like InDesign files. Uh, although I really don't know. Uh, this, is, this is hard stuff. I mean, um, I, I personally have DVDs from the time we were in Reading uh, that don't work anymore. Like yeah. you put them in that, oh, this computer doesn't even have a drive, but you know, I put them in my wife's computer and it's like, well, that this doesn't even show up. Yeah. So I have files that are gone. Uh, I mean, most things are backed up on other drives, but uh, it's pretty frustrating that I'm witnessing media die. Uh, and I, just, I, I don't know what's going to happen with this. I fear actually that the cloud is gonna make things worse because I think the cloud services are going to fail, some of them, and people will be like, oh, all my files are gone uh, because this company went bankrupt. Um, it's a funny thing to think about, but it's totally coming. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I'm really worried, I'll stop this, uh, and get to another question, but I'm really worried, I'll use this public Buna um, stage, I'm really worried about um, uh, Monotype's offices. Uh, uh, last year, there were press releases that Monotype was reducing its footprint. Uh, they, there were some staff who were let go, and I bet that they're going to uh, downsize their office space, maybe move to smaller spaces, and when companies do that, they throw stuff away. So files get deleted, do old servers make the trip, uh, uh, do old printouts that were archived, do they make the trip, you know, physical storage and electronic storage cost money. And uh, you know, if you're trying to save money as a business, are you gonna keep paying for that? You know, like, I think those things belong in a museum, but you know, they're not mine. Uh, if I call Monotype up and say, hey Monotype, do you wanna donate to that to a museum? They're gonna say no. I know because they said on Twitter that they weren't gonna do that. No. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, um, I don't know. I really worry about it a lot. During your uh, talk, which was wonderful, uh, I was wondering, um, you're probably familiar with uh, Ricardo Loco's uh, way of uh, differentiating uh, the 15th century typefaces. Mm -hmm. Were you doing any of that for uh, the early sans serif that were similar to differentiate, or were you basing all your research on the specimens where you could actually know that this comes from this foundry or this? 
I, my, met, my comparison network is not nearly as thorough or systematic as Ricardo's. Uh, I, I have an alibi as to why that is. Um, <laughs> or, uh, the main reason is that printing in the 19th century is much better. So uh, uh, Renaissance printers were printing on handmade paper, uh, on, uh, on wooden uh, presses, and they dampened their paper, and all of these factors work together to really influence the impression of the letter on the page. And so um, part of what's so groundbreaking about Ricardo's work is he's been able to prove that Jensen wasn't the only uh, uh, printer in Venice during Jensen's lifetime to use his types, but lots of other Italian printers were using Jensen's types too, and this is direct contradiction to what a lot of established thinking in incannabular research was. Um, but uh, uh, fortunately, in the mid-19th century, uh, people are printed on machine-made paper, which has its problems too, but at least it's even and consistent. Uh, uh, they're printing on iron presses, which can exert uh, more or less an equal amount of pressure across the entire page. Uh, the ink is better. Um, so uh, you're, there's less distortion. There's less artifacts of the printing process on the page. Uh, there is still some, of course, but it's less. And so it's easier to do a naked eye comparison. Um, uh, I have done digital comparisons where I uh, have sort of placed uh, things on top of each other, um, and uh, uh, that's helpful, obviously. I don't do it as systematically as uh, Ricardo. Uh, uh, part of uh, uh, the reason for that, too, is that uh, the libraries I use are not all super photography friendly, and a lot of the images that I rely on for comparison, I have to order from not just from image scanning services, but from professional photographers who work with the museum. And they get to come in and make sure that the, you know, the page is flattened and they do great work with building up supports under the book and using lights. And uh, 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 I'm not able to control that process myself, so I'm not able to get the kind of uh, uh, even across the board images, uh, at least in Berlin. Uh, that Ricardo is able to uh, now, so I'm really quite envious of that. Uh, but I don't, there are cases where that kind of analysis would be really helpful. Uh, but in a lot of uh, uh, 19th century type, that level of microanalysis isn't necessary. Thank you. <coughs> you work at uh, Lucas Fonts. I do. Yes. You are American. Lucas is Dutch. He's Dutch. And uh, the style of most of the typeface made at Lucas Font are based on a certain kind of Dutchness, humanistic, yes. sensory, open, legible. Mm -hmm. And then you came up with all these uh, illegible 19th century German uh -huh. style typeface. Yeah. Or oh, it's possible to work with Lucas every day? Um, well, I mean. It's a joke, little I, uh, bit. Huh? I Come mean, on. The, the trick question, the answer to this question is that uh, 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 corporate uh, uh, design clients want wonky 19th century German sans serif typefaces uh, at the moment. You know, like uh, everyone wants to have sort of like, you know, that sort of typeface uh, and not necessarily uh, a geometric face or or. Do you or think that Lucas says, with design one day such typeface no. with you? No. 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 That's fine. No. That's not why I joined uh, the company. Um, but uh, I, I I'll say that uh, you know Lucas's fonts are text faces. Um, and they're, uh, all of them are used for you know, whole books, newspapers, that sort of thing. Uh, and that's not what these typefaces are for. So I think it's okay, you know, like, if I were to come in and say that, you know, I had developed like a new legibility test that proved that these were more legible somehow, I mean, it's not possible. But, you know, if I were to, if that were my opinion, I think that there might be a problem 